our lessons are coming from those. We're kind of this, our lessons are really kind of discussions of those messages. So we want to encourage you to do that. Along with that, we want to encourage you to comment. Um, feel free to share as you have been. You've been doing a great job so far. But just a couple insights on, on, on how to maximize our commenting potential. We are recording. So if you comment, speak up, speak loud, or it'll just be a recording of me or Nate or John standing here nodding. <laughs> <laughs> and we want people to hear, people who are watching it later, to hear what you have to say. So please speak up. And secondly, along with those lines, is we want to hear what everybody has to say. So keep your comments uh, concise as you can. And and uh, so that people can respond to you, we like a give and take in our in our comments. Okay, um, so and that kind of relates to what we're talking about today about sharing the gospel. All right, we want to listen, we want to give and take, we want to respond. So in order for that to happen, sometimes our comments have to be abbreviated. All right, and I know that's the pot calling the kettle black, um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, so let's so let's keep our comments. Uh, short enough to respond to. All right. So the first one I wanted to kind of go over again and look at again is be real. All right. When we're talking to people about sharing the gospel, we should be real. And uh, one of the things that Alice everybody talks about is Christianese. What's Christianese? Speaking a language that the world doesn't understand. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking a language that the world doesn't understand. Give me some examples. Atonement. <laughs> there you go. Atonement. Justification, yeah. sanctification. Yeah, big terms that they don't know. Even grace, what, what? even yeah. grace, yeah. And resurrection. Mm -hmm. Resurrection, yeah. Even you'll find that as as you get into conversations with people who are in our culture or in the in the surrounding culture, that even words like love have vastly different mm -hmm. meanings. All right. And so you want to speak in a way that they can understand, in a way that they know what you're talking about. Otherwise, if you don't uh, define some things, if you don't, if you're not clear, you can give them a completely wrong idea without even realizing you're giving them a completely wrong idea. All right. So don't use Christianese. Right? Using high Christianese to describe God and His work, it kind of creates a barrier between God and the day to day. You know. Um, even in the church, even in the church, when we use hyper-spiritual language, we kind of create a barrier between God. There's, you know, things of the church, Christianese, sanctification, justification, all that stuff. And then there's, you know, my my Monday 9 to 5, you know, never the two shall meet. That's not the God we serve, all right? We have a God who wants to be in the very minutia of the day-to-day -day with us, all right? So sometimes those terms are really helpful, but I tend, I tend to think that they're less helpful than we think they are, all right? They're, even, in a, in, even in a scholarly conversation, I tend to think they, they boost up our ego <laughs> and, and God tells us to die to self, all right? So get rid of it. As much as you can, all right, in your in your day to day conversation. So that's just one way of being real. What's another way to be real? First is to get rid of Christianese. What's another way to be real? Share your experience. Exactly. Share your story, your experience. Yeah, that's our testimony, right? Testimony isn't just how we came to Christ. It's what God is doing in our lives right now. Share our struggles and our failures. Share our struggles, and our failures. That's failures. so good. Our failures. Why is it important to share our failures? I'm getting ahead of my note team, but why is it important to share our failures? Because we're all human. So we don't come across as holier than thou, so that we come across as people who understand and have been in the same boat mm -hmm. and, you know, that we be the savior as much as the person we're abandoned. Amen. Absolutely. So. I actually had someone tell me they were afraid to tell me something because they thought, I wouldn't understand I'm so perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not. But yeah. I didn't realize I had been portraying myself there. That way, you yeah. that person. Yeah. Good. Sometimes it's hard to prevent, you know, until we get in a conversation with someone, that sometimes people just look at Christians and think, oh, they got it all together. Um, but but when they begin to hear from us that we have real struggles, you know, that's a, that's a witness to them. 
it's a it's a it's a witness to them to know that that we have this relationship with God and we are not perfect. At summer games, which is a camp I speak at every every summer, there's this young man who has his own struggles I won't go into. He became one of the leaders for this last week's camp. But out of necessity, they needed a, a male leader, so they recruited this kid. But it he, it worked out great. God is good. It worked out great. And uh, every single morning, I meet with all our huddle leaders, and I share with them However, the Lord leads me to share with them about the about the ministry that they're going to do this that coming day. Um, and at the end of the week, that huddle leader, that young man came up to me and said, Pastor Brian, it's really good to, to spend time with you every day and and see that you're not just this paragon of Jesus. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, it sounds insulting that what I'm what do you mean I'm not a paragon? You know. <laughs> um but what he meant was just that he got a chance to see the real me and not just the guy who stands and preaches and shares the gospel with them on a, on a, on a group basis, but he got the chance to know who I am. And that's what people are looking for uh, when when they're going to be talking with you, and especially when you're sharing the gospel with them. They want to know who you really are. All right. Is that scary? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's scary. But we're going to talk about being courageous in a bit here. So be real, be open, be vulnerable, get rid of Christianese, just get rid of it, all right? So there's another kind of Christianese too that I want to cover that I don't know about. my notes are going to get there, but is like hyper-spirituality, all right? Someone who uh, just is so bubbly and spiritual like all the time, and um, they might not use big words like sanctification, justification, but they're just, everything is, oh, praise the Lord, or Oh, thank God, you know, all the time. That, you know, it's good if that's genuine. If that's genuine, that's good. But if it's just trying to sound spiritual, that's not good. Anytime, anytime that you have within you when you're communicating in the church or in the world where you are presenting any kind of facade, I would say you need to get rid of it. Any kind of facade. And, you know, that's hard because... We are used to presenting facades. Everywhere we go, work, school, church, there's a new facade. Get rid of it. Get rid of it as much as you can. Get rid of it. Because it's not about the picture of you. It's about pointing to Christ. Right? So as much as you can, be vulnerable. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I don't want to come across as hyper spiritual, but <laughs> I think uh, for Diane and I, if we can see an opportunity to offer a neighbor or somebody to say we can we pray for you. Yeah, that's that's great. And I think as Christians, we need to be bringing the spirit to the natural, mm -hmm. and so I think that's a simple thing that people won't Amen. be offended at. That you're concerned about that person's life and say, hey, can I pray for this need for you or whatever Amen. you're going through? And I don't think I've ever been rejected for that. Amen. That's good. You know, and what, what happens when you do that? When you when because several people have said that. So what happens when you say, Can I pray can I pray for you? And and most of the time they're gonna say yes. And then what happens later? I mean, I'm almost in almost every relationship that God's led me to do that with, something something has followed. Any, can anybody speak to that? I can speak to it because they will tell you if there are problems that are going on. Yeah. 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 They'll come back and, and ask you to pray for something else. You know? Go ahead. So um, Doug and I had a habit of asking our waiters and waitresses if we could pray for them when we were at a restaurant. And we asked a young man um, at Cruz Amir, and he said, Would you please pray that I get into PT school? Mm -hmm. Well, four years later, I ended up having a frozen shoulder, and he was the guy that was at oh, the oh place that I went to. He didn't remember me initially, but I said, I remember you, and then I reminded him about that. He said, do remember you. And then I said, so your, my prayers were answered for you, and I was able to. Praise God. What a witness. What a witness. Oh, my. Praise the Lord. All right. So, oh, oh God. Stepping up one more yep. is, is actually pretty right there. Yes, amen. Yes, that's good. 
It's, I mean, even in the church, that that's matters and important, right? That we say, oh, I'll pray for you about that. Sometimes that's kind of like a, it's treated like a, I'll deal with you later, you know, but it, but in actuality, <laughs> you pray for them when you say, can I pray for you right now? You know, um, some of them aren't, aren't going to be willing for that, but what a cool thing when they are, right? Sure. To be able to actually pray for them. Yeah, right they're 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 saying, no. Yes. I mean, usually it's a, you're a moment for that. Yeah, so yeah. It's, a, it's a God moment. It's awesome. I use the telephone too. If someone is sharing their problems with me, you know, yeah. then I'll say, can we pray about that, right? Praise God. And Amen. the phone is a good connection. If there's someone I know well enough that they're talking with me on the phone. Amen. And so even in our prayers, I would say we need to get rid of Christianese, right? Mm-hmm. Um, even in our prayers, we want to, because remember, that we're praying with someone who doesn't speak that language. And we want to pray in such a way that they that they can participate in that prayer with us. Okay. Um, so even if I would I would say if, if you get into the habit of using Christianese and something comes out of your mouth, it's gonna be hard to not say it sometimes. Take a second and pray it in day to day language. Define it. Yeah. All right. Just pray it. And 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 let them make sure they're understanding what's actually being prayed for. Go ahead. I just can say that sometimes if casually you say you pray for somebody, do it right away. Yeah. Sometimes it's easy to forget, and then you don't want to, for me, do it right away. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, one more thing. I also like if you pop into something like fire. Yeah. So every time I bump into something, I'm reminded to pray for whoever. Oh, like a funny bone. Yeah. <laughs> he told my son I'd pray for uh, what's the guy's name? Howard Stern. He left how he's going to die. Well, let's pray for him. And so every time I bump into Oh, that's a good idea. I let that slide too, so I didn't do it again. I'm being yeah. reminded. But. That'd be great for Don. Don's nickname is Stubbs. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's always stubbing your toe. So. So what is the idea, Don? <laughs> Someone used the term elevator moments too. Oh yeah. Throughout your day, they were using the concept of you're standing there for a minute or so waiting for the elevator to mm-hmm. come. That you can be using that time to say, Lord, uh, walk with me today. Show me Amen. Amen. who Amen. you want me to speak with. Amen. Or or just Laying out our needs, or laying out our prayers, just anything. If you're stopped at a red light, you know, it's just Amen. all kinds of little brief moments. Yeah, Paul says, really "Pray without ceasing." ceasing. Yeah. Pray without ceasing. Go ahead. This is my hair. So I'm gonna say it quick. My hairdresser is obsessed. With her. He's not a superpower. She knows this stuff. I can't believe her. This week she's talking to me about, and I know it not that well. But um, she's talking about Nicodemus. I just love Nicodemus. I'm so glad you made that big deal about him because it brought it back to me. And she's like, but you know, we had a choice. Of, you know, he helped me the right choice. I'm like, you know, uh, the whole uh, thing uh, was that uh, he had to choose uh, him. It was hard. And she's like, well, you know, we have to choice. I think it's no, it's to choose him. You know, yeah. but it was a total moment. She totally changed the country. That's good. But it was so good to have that. What do we think? And that's the thing about about even what we think like. Oh, he didn't respond the way I wanted to, or oh, you know, or we're, we're, we're deflated. You don't know what God's doing with that conversation after you leave. They're still going to be, they're still going to be hounded by the hound of heaven, sure. who's going to be coming after them and and, and speak to them about, about what you conversed with them about. Sure. Okay, Amen. so so trust that God's going to use it. I planted the seed of Paulus water, but God gave the growth. All right, Amen. The next thing I also talk about is being brave. So be real, be vulnerable, be brave. Um, so if you know the Lord is leading, even if the storm is raging, being brave is about be, about getting out of the safety of the boat and getting into the water. If the Lord is calling you, leading you to share, do it. Be brave. God tells his people to be brave. Uh, and be, be courageous throughout scripture, but there's usually he gives a a reason for bravery. What is that reason? The Lord your God is with you. 
The Lord your God is with you. Deuteronomy 31, 6 through 8. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. And he will not leave you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous. For you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them. And you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. You know how many times the Lord said he would be with them just in those two verses? God's going to be with you. God's going to be with you. God's going to be with you. I'm calling you to go. Go and make disciples. But you're not on your own. God's going to be with you. And so in Matthew 16, 18, uh, I want to this uh, this connects to that verse. Matthew 16, 18, Peter had just proclaimed the truth of who Jesus is. And we see Jesus saying this. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So there's a couple things in that sentence that should give us courage. What are they? What, are, what does Jesus say there in that sentence that ought to give the Christian courage? On this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What's in there that should give you courage? Well, it's a promise that uh, God is going to prevail in those circumstances. Amen. Not, not people that we're talking to or working. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Well, and then if God is with us, then we can fight against those gates of some love. All right. We don't this... need to stand for what then? Good. So the word I yeah. is the first one. Right. I. Who's going to build the church? You? Me? <laughs> Who builds the church? I. I will build my church. I will be with you. Who's going to conquer the land? Israel? No. God is going to conquer the land. All right. I will build my church. Go and make disciples. But who's who's building the church? Jesus is building the church. All right. I will build my church. Jesus is not absent when, when we go. He is with us. He is accomplishing his work through us. All right. The it's second thing. It's a partnership. It's a partnership. Yes. 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 Yeah. We, we don't get back and walk. Exactly. We don't get to sit back. That, that would be disobedience. <laughs> All right. We have to go. I will go, I will build my church. Um, but but he calls us to go and do it. All right. Um you were making me think of Noah, uh, not but, Noah Jonah, Jonah who tried yeah. to run away from God. Yeah. And he couldn't do it. Yeah. yeah. I don't want God to have to let the man be the way he did Jonah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot about Jonah that we should really consider. All right, uh, I won't get into that now. But Jonah, Jonah had, teaches us a lot on the negative as well. All right, his attitude and everything, but but he went, even though he didn't want to. He went. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I just think about that um, connection between Joshua and leading the people into the land and mm -hmm. us. Um, being courageous in the situation that we find ourselves in because God was always putting his people in situations mm -hmm. where um, it was clear they couldn't do it by themselves mm -hmm. um, but it was those who stepped out and were obedient and, and um, trusted in God going forward that saw him work and Man. their faith was confirmed by their obedience because Man. God clearly showed up and did what they knew they couldn't do. So then the next time there's more confidence and more connects up. It's God's way of growing our faith and growing our confidence. Um, but if we on the one hand say, well, it's all up to me, then we're going to be overwhelmed. And then on the other hand, we say, oh, it's all up to God, then we never do anything. We we miss what God has for us. That's what it is. Amen. Amen. Um, just a, a clarification on, on the whole partnership thing. Um, it doesn't take courage to sit. God saying be strong and courageous. It doesn't take courage just to do nothing. You know, hold on to the rails of that boat as hard as you can in the storm. That's 
not the definition of courageous, right? It's not the definition of courageousness to say, man, those guys in that land are you. I'm not going. That's not courageous. So action is implied in being strong and courageous. All right. Go. All right. Go. Um, that's the, the one of the things that the church struggles with the most. That it says, we we just want to do make disciples, make disciples. But there's a go in front of that. <laughs> go and make disciples. All right. Um, we want we need to go, go into the world. All right. And so um, another the second thing in in that uh, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Just was touched about touched on by Sue. Talk about the gates of hell. What what are gates? An opening. They're an opening, but what are they in ancient times? Very, very they very were a defensive position. Right? The gates of hell are the defensive position. They are they are the entry into the city, but they are a fortified defensive position. All right. Um, and so why does this matter in our understanding of the of evangelism and the church? And God has to open the gates for us. God has to open the gates for us, yes. What else? We tend to see the world as coming against us. Yeah, right? It's true. That we are the fortress and the world's assailing us. That's how we tend to think of our faith, ourselves, our world, our reality. But well, we just we we had to make sure we batten down the hatches, get all the archers in position to shoot the enemy as they're attacking us. That's not the pe- picture that Jesus is painting. That's not the picture that Deuteronomy is painting. All right, we tend we see the world as coming against us as though we are the standard, as mm-hmm. though we were behind strong walls and are under assault from enemy forces. But actually, the opposite is true. Those who defend a fortress will never set prisoners of the enemy free, and that's what we're called to do. We're called to set prisoners of the enemy. Free. We can't do that behind behind uh, fortif- fortified walls, all right. And so, like Joshua, we are in an invading ar- army. We are invading enemy territory. Satan is the god of this world, and the church is on the offensive to set those he has imprisoned free. Jesus is saying that the very defensive walls of hell itself cannot stand against the church. All right. Um, does that mean that those outside the walls are our enemy? That's not what it's talking about. Those outside the walls are prisoners that we are called to sacrificially love and bring the gospel to to set them free. All right. We are we are the ones on the offensive with the weapon of love, <laughs> with the weapon of the gospel. All right. That's the that's what Jesus is talking about there. He's not talking about uh really kind of the mindset that we're really seeing growing in the church today, that is setting up walls, seeing any, everybody outside the walls as enemy. That's not the gospel. Okay. Well, we, we know someone who has the keys to the gate. Exactly. You know, that can um, release. It's about release, not even, um, I was thinking about what Jeff said and, and kind of reiterating it, that um, Christ gives us a chance to, to not to be a piece in the journey of someone. I remember two words story and how I how that changed things at that time. You know, that it's not just about my story, it's about what God has done in my story. Yeah. And that's yeah. that's what I am called to to relate and be humble about. I think it's a humility as well. Uh, where God is in your life as opposed to where you put yourself and what does gates of hell tell us about like the character of the people that are out there that is anyone out of god's reach what does jesus say about the uh tax collectors and prostitutes they're the ones who need it the most they're the ones who need it the most that's yes that's definitely part of it what else did he say in in comparison to the pharisees they were coming to god more quickly than the religious. They were coming to God ahead of you, Jesus. All right? So those we see as moral, they might be the furthest from God. Those that we see are, are, are like they are a lost cause, might be right on the brink. You know, that's where I was before I came to Christ. 
You, no one would have looked at me and said, hey, next year, that kid's going to be the, the head of the Bible club. He's going to be called into ministry. He's going to be leading people to Christ. They would have said, that guy is dangerous. I don't want my son or daughter to have anything to do with him. That's how they would have thought of me. You know. In fact, I remember uh, that's how I was treated when I was forced to go to church. I sat here, the rest of the class would sit over here. Because I was a threat. All right? They didn't know that I would be leading their group the next year. Go ahead, John. <laughs> this random thing came across my news feed last night about a woman who is a star on some on ink. Uh, tattoo show. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Who's a, who was a Satanist who was baptized last yeah. week? Yeah, yeah. praise God. Her yeah. name is Kat Von Dean. Yeah, yeah. She came to Christ. How amazing! You know, praise the Lord. Those sometimes are the, are the strongest testimonies. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Why? Well, so why is that though? It, get, it gets to some of the. Crux of what we're talking about, the 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 state of the world. Why why is it that those people are closer, are getting in, in ahead of the Pharisees? Why is that? So Diane got her hand up and then. Well, I maybe mean, I misunderstood your question. Um, I think that they're very effective because other people can see themselves sure. in them. Yeah, I absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we see a definite transformation there. Right. That's not really what I'm asking, but that's still a good point. So then Tina and and on the line diet because they're so dark. There's so much darkness in them. God can pull them out of that. Sure. Yeah. Well. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Two again. Um, well, they know the um, spiritual world, the dark side of the mm -hmm. spiritual world really well. Yeah. And I know in part of the little, I don't know if you call it a testimony or just some comment she had made is that um, she saw how that was not benefiting her. It wasn't mm -hmm. good. So, somehow, you know, mm -hmm. Holy Spirit got hold of her. I don't know that whole story yet. But um, she can then take that. I mean, obviously, she's going to get a lot of attack from mm -hmm. all her followers. That she has yeah. Um, but she can take that and relate, you know, to all those people. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what what you're thinking, how you feel, but but now she has a Holy Spirit, Amen. and now she's going to know the power of that Holy Spirit, unlike so many even Christians don't know. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. no. <laughs> I was just going to say, we've kind of said before, if God can save someone who's been through what they've been through, seen what they've seen, and done what they've had done to them, and everybody else is a piece of cake. They should think of the prodigal son. He, he knew how far he had fallen. That's good. He knew it was nothing to do with him that he was accepted back. It's mm -hmm. nothing. But the righteous big brother kind of felt mm -hmm. like, well, I'm good. You know, yeah. He was full of his own wisdom. Yes, and exactly. That's exactly. So yeah. And that's what relates to, to uh, Alistair's points um, about showing them the state of the world, all right, about their state. So go ahead, John. Yeah, often people who are um, in those dark places are the ones who are either searching or trying to numb the pain. Mm -hmm. But they're aware of the brokenness of the world and the hopelessness that, that they find themselves. Often, you know, the those who are moral mm -hmm. don't know they're sick. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and those who are just locked in a you know, what's the next happy thing that's going to happen uh, kind of mentality? Where can I get my next uh, fun time? That they aren't thinking about those things. It reminds me of um, C.S. Lewis um, in in his book, which the name of it escapes me right now, but Satan, um, where he he is using the voice of a yeah. demon who is, what's the name of this? The screw tape letters, yeah. Um, the demon wants to get the guy to be an atheist after he becomes a Christian. Mm -hmm. And Satan says, no, don't do that, because you'll get him thinking about <laughs> things of matters of truth and untruth. You want to numb him. You don't want to get him against God, because it will probably drive him closer to God mm -hmm. to be thinking about those kinds of things. 
I think in a lot of cases like that, a lot of people, um, in her case, she has friends around her that are watching her. Mm -hmm. And in that case, in that particular case, and, and it's, 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 she, they need to see the transformation in her. Yeah. And I think God will work through her friends. Let me just uh, kind of head us off a little bit of a different direction in this conversation um, about that type of people, because I was one of the, those type of people. And I can, so I can speak to Kat and to myself and to, and Don uh, had the same type of experience that we believe that the testimony of growing up in a Christian home, what a testimony that is, you know? So the difference is really, and this has to, and we have to be willing to share this. The difference is, the, is what John touched on, the realization of your sin. The realization of your state, the, of how lost you are without Jesus. That is why tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom ahead of the Pharisees. Jesus said, the, the, in the conversation with the Pharisees, he said, because you say we see, your sin remains. Because you think you got it. Because you think you know because you think you're righteous. You know the word Pharisees actually means set apart ones, which refers back to holiness. Mm -hmm. So the Pharisees, even by their very name, are, are saying, well, we are the holy. We are God's chosen of God's chosen. <clears throat> so because you say we see, your sin remains. And so that's why some of the hardest people to witness to are, are people that are moral and come at you with, well, I'm a, I'm a good person. We gotta. Who, what is that saying? We gotta let them know we're lost before we can let them know they can be saved. Mm -hmm. I don't remember who said that, but someone said, it, and it was it's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so another thing Alistair talked on talks about was be imaginative. Some of us are not imaginative ma imaginative people, and that I would fall into that category. Um, when it comes to relationships, especially, we're not imaginative. I am not. Socially uh, adapt, all right. Um, I, I, it's like I have a an ongoing conversation with several people about whether I'm whether I'm introverted or not. They just don't believe that I'm introverted because I'm out in front all the time. I am introverted. When I get home from church, I collapse. Right when you know people exhaust me. Do I love people? Yes. Is that in my nature to? to uh, be in front, to be relational all the time. No, it's in my nature to be a hermit in a cabin up in the woods by the stream. That's my nature. That's where, you know, that's not what God has called me to, all right? He hasn't called me to that. Um, and he will work in our weakness, amen? Um, so I'm saying all that because I'm not imaginative in any way. So here's the point. Do whatever God tells you to do. Whatever the Holy Spirit, however He directs you, however He leads you, do whatever He does as long as as long as He leads you, or however He leads you, as long as it doesn't contradict the example of Christ or the Word of God. I know of a of a young man who was praying uh, that God would use him, and God said, "Well, the Holy Spirit told him to go buy a gallon of milk and bring it to that house right there." And he's just walking down the street, doesn't know who lives where, so you know. And then to that point, we could argue and say, I don't know if this is really Holy Spirit. That seems really strange, really weird. And so he does it, gets the milk, goes to the house, rings the doorbell, lady opens up the door, and he says, the, God told me to bring you a gallon of milk. Turns out, she had a young child, a baby that she didn't know how she was going to be, didn't know how she was going to meet her needs. Didn't have food to to give the give the child or herself, and she just was praying, literally praying, God, if you just could give me a gallon of milk. And here he opens the door with a gallon of milk. We hear testimonies like that all the time. It's because the the body of Christ was faithful to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Keep in, pray continuously. Do what God tells you to do. 
doesn't matter how weird it might be. Do it as long as it doesn't contradict the word of God. Follow how God leads. Go ahead. It takes me back. I can't shake it when Jesus said, "Upon this rock, I will build my church." He was talking about Peter making a declaration that you are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. And Jesus was saying to Peter, "You're Simon, son of Barjona." Mm -hmm. It was the relationship that you, God knows you. And you can know God, and that is the rock <laughs> that builds the church. You walking with God, God walking with you, and listening to his voice like you're saying, that relationship is key to building the church. God knowing you and you knowing God. Amen. Amen. The next, the next B that Alistair gives us is be direct. So whenever we evangelize, we should have fixed in our mind three fundamental truths that we wish to convey. And so that's part of being direct. Um, according to Alistair's teaching, who can remember what those three fundamental truths are? Do you, do you have them? First is the bad news of humanity's condition. And that's Romans. I'm just going to give you Romans here. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Second is the good news of God's provision. And that's Romans 3, 24. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And also, uh, the good news of God's provision is John 3.16. We all know that. And then 1 Timothy 1.15, which says, the saying is, this saying is trustworthy and deserving full acceptance, full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Right? And then, so that's the, let them know the bad news of humanity's condition, the good news of God's provision, and thirdly, the necessity of personal response. And that's Romans 10, 9. Uh, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So one of the things uh, Elster talks about in this latest message is sharing the fullness of the gospel, um, sharing the fullness of who Jesus really is, the truth of, about who he really is and what he really uh, desires for people. And we're going to talk about that in a bit. But I wanted to say for Romans 10, 9 kind of, kind of gives us a, some fuel to step into this. Um, make sure that when you communicate verses like Romans 10, 9, that you make it clear what is actually being said. All right. Sometimes we read Romans 10, 9 and we think, oh, all it takes is, is, is believing in my heart and confessing that Jesus is the Lord and I'm set. But we don't really digest what that means to say Jesus is Lord. That's talking, that's not just a casual flippant prayer. That's a prayer of lordship. Right? Jesus as a confession of lordship. All right. Um, it's not just a get out of free, uh, get out of jail free card. All right. It's it's actually uh salvation is not just a get out of jail free card, it's the death of one life and the birth and progressive growth of another. All right. Um, it's not just a life enhancement. All right. So we want to we want to make sure we're being we're being honest when we're presenting the gospel with people. All right. Um, sometimes there's been pushback at that saying, well, we don't want to like burn people out and scare them away. And I would say, well, who's our example of the best evangelist? Jesus. So what did Jesus do? He was with them, but what, did he did he hide who he was? No. Sometimes he did. Like he said, he said, "Don't tell." Of this. That was just because of timing. But what did he do to the crowd? We just I just preached on it last two weeks ago to the crowd that was following, and he said, "Hey, come here. Take up your cross. Take up your cross and follow. Me. If you want to follow me, this is what it costs." He was Jesus was not a PR expert, but he knew exactly the effect that his words would have on people. And he didn't hide or didn't share or didn't uh, paint a, a easy believism picture for people. All right. He told them exactly what it means to follow him. Go ahead. Tom. Yeah, it goes back to what I was saying a few weeks ago about the human condition that we often Past the human condition in terms of 
the sins that we do, the 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 things that we do, and and sometimes even say, you know, if you've only ever committed one sin in your whole life, you're still and, and that but that doesn't actually tell the truth about the human condition. The human condition is that we want to be Lord. Mm-hmm. And that is the fundamental thing out of which um, uh, all of our, everything we do, whether it's good or bad, is counted as unrighteous because it's a position of rebellion. So in order to help people understand that that's their problem, then to confess Jesus as Lord is to come to terms with the fact that you aren't. Yeah, and that's a hard thing to do. <laughs> Amen. Come to turn to the fact that you aren't. Yep. Amen. Amen. So let's. There's some. There's. We're going to skip ahead a little bit because we're running out of time. Um, there's some helpful questions that Alistair gives us. Um, that when we're when we find ourselves in a conversation with someone that is leading in this direction, he gives us a couple of helpful questions that we want to cover. And so the first one is: Have you personally trusted Christ? Or are you still on the way? All right. Like if you are in a conversation with someone and it gets to that point where that question is needed, you know, and you don't know, you don't know where to go. You don't know how to um, bring up their need and whether or not they have come to Christ or not. This question is, is easy. It's not threatening, um, but it actually gets to the, makes them examine themselves. And the question again is, have you personally Trusted Jesus Christ. What page are we on? Oh boy, I don't have the I don't have the book in front of me. What chapter? Um, oh, this is just just in the sermon. This is just oh. in the sermon, not in the not in the books. So I'm just really covering the sermon. Right? <laughs> um, uh, so have you personally trusted Christ, or are you still on the way? This is chapter eight that we're in. Um, page forty five is an outline. I don't know on the book. Oh. Okay. So have you personally personally trusted Christ, or are you still on the way? So even if you feel like you already know the answer to this question, you've been in a conversation with someone about the gospel, you've been sharing Christ with them, you think you know where they stand. Is it still good to ask? Yes. Why would it still be good to ask? Even if you know. Go ahead. Well, it's it's a journey. Letting them know that the initial, I don't know if I see surrender or thinking about it is the beginning and that um, this is your beginning with Christ mm-hmm. and that as you learn and study and get dive into the word that you'll see that that's ongoing mm-hmm. and that um, God wants you asking him to well, I guess either way to answer is um, they say yes, then they're going to be trusting um, And then you do something. Yeah. Um, so, but just answering either way out loud is different than just saying it in your head. Amen. Amen. And so there's power in, in, in them speaking their state out loud. All right. Even if it is a state of unbelief, you know. Remember when we're, we are in a conversation with people, we're not just conversing at people. We are we are conversing with people, and we want them to we want them to answer honestly and just and even if it's to say, you know, I just I don't believe, or I'm just I'm not at that point yet, or I really haven't trusted Christ. It's good for them to say that. It's good for them to verbalize that for many different reasons. Because we need to know where they're coming from. We need to know what their need is. And it's also good for them to verbalize it. Because when you say something, you don't just say it, you feel it. You you interact with what you just said. All right? It's out there now. And and now you have to deal with what just came out of your mouth. All right, go ahead. Yeah, it just brings us back to what we've been talking about in Mark. And really the question that lies at the center of Mark's gospel is, Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? And that's a question that that every human being could can, can be confronted with and should be confronted with. To, to, to wrestle with that question, well, who is this guy? Yeah, and who do you say that I am? Amen. So the follow-up question would be um, that Elster gives is how far along the way are you? 
And so nail them down. How far along the way are you? And so Elster says that here the devil will cause distraction. So be on the lookout for distraction and pray against it when it comes. Ask for God's intervention to keep the focus on him. And Elster suggests emphasizing the fact that tomorrow is not promised and that the Bible teaches that today is the day of salvation. You want to bring it back to today. And sometimes they might just, they just might not be ready. All right. But you want to emphasize that fact is, is, is that today is the day of salvation. And the question that I like to, to ask in that situation is, um, and you know, these questions are going to make people wiggle sometimes. They're going to be uncomfortable, but to say, well, well, what's holding you back? What's keeping you back from trusting in Christ? You want to get them to verbalize this stuff, to say it out loud. Um, very often, you're gonna when you get into a conversation with someone about the gospel, uh, about about God, about their state, um, they're going to verbalize to you some things, some impressions about God that they might have, that they might carry, or some barriers that are between them and the Lord that you need them to verbalize because you don't know that there are barriers between them and the Lord. And you need them to verbalize these incorrect thoughts about who God is in order for you to communicate the truth of who God is. All right. So many people in the world today are getting uh, ideas about who God is and who Jesus is that are unbiblical and incorrect. All right. And for in order them for them to come to Christ, we need to hear them. We need to be able to speak to them. All right. And so. Um, it's good for them to verbalize this stuff, even if it sounds negative, because we want to be we want to know uh, where they are and what's keeping them back. So one of the things I, I've said many times, people say, I don't believe this or this or this about God. And I said, oh, I don't believe in that God either. Most of the times, if the, the God that they don't believe in that could cause this or that is not the God of the Bible. All right. And so when they verbalize that stuff, you can let them know. I, and I'll tell you. Um, one of my one of my cousins uh, that I have every time I've gone home lately, he's God's opened the door for him to be right next to me, um, like literally physically right next to me in a, in a seat. He's a captive audience, and uh, um, immediately we begin talking about Christ. And uh, he is very disillusioned with the church, uh, very disillusioned with Christianity, and the way God has used our conversation every single time I've gone lately has been. That's not what the, that's not the biblical Christ. That's not who God is. That idea, that things that's turning you away from the Lord, that's not who, who the Lord is. Um, and so you you want to you want them to be speaking truth to you. So speaking their truth to that to you, even though even if it's a lie, they want you want them to actually be honest with you about how they think and feel, so that you can share the, the biblical Christ. I think the question, what's holding you back, is important because they may not even ever answer that it. question. Amen. Amen. They may, might not ever consider that question. All right. Here's the, here's another thing. Is sometimes we get afraid of like of of exactly what I'm saying that we don't want to present the biblical Christ because of the cost. Um, and I want to just share a couple quick stories with you about that. Um, about counting the cost. Um, the first is there's this, both of them are from youth group. Um, and, uh, the first was from a, a girl that was in our youth group here. And, uh, I was preaching. I'd only been here a few years and I was, I was teaching and preaching about how the Lord would calls us to lay ourselves down to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. He called us to give all, all of who we are to him. And this girl didn't like that. And so she started going around to different youth in the, in, in our group and saying, you know, giving the illustration, this was her, her illustration. If you had a half a sandwich or you had a sandwich and you offered a friend a half of the, of your sandwich, wouldn't they be happy with that? So wouldn't God be happy with half of your sandwich, half of who you are? <laughs> um, and that's how she started because she was worried. It's the same thing. She was worried that Pastor Brian's call, uh, Pastor Brian's preaching from the scripture that God wants all of us. It was going to turn some people off. So wouldn't God be satisfied with just half? But that's not the biblical truth. That's not the biblical truth. And 
And I want to tell you that almost everybody she had influence with are not following the Lord today. Um, and there's another girl in our youth group that was several years later. Now the it, the the dynamics of the group had flipped, right? So now we have this whole group of youth that are really following after Jesus. They're all art. And she is the outlier. She is the one that doesn't want to. And she responded to me over over dinner with, well, you're always talking about how the Lord wants all of us and and uh but I just want him to to make my life better. And I shared with her the call of Christ that he desires to give you a new life, not just better your old life. He desires to give you his life in you when you lay your life down. And she came back to exactly what John was talking about, that, no, I, I want to be my own Lord. I want God to better my life, but it's still my life. And so she is even now living in rebellion. Right? But when she comes to Christ, when she comes to the biblical Christ, she will have a relationship with the real Christ. Right? When we throw when we throw seeds out onto rocky ground purposefully, what happens? If we were to throw our seeds onto rocky ground, because that's what we're doing when we share this, this uh, easy believism gospel, and we just throw sow, sow seeds of easy believism. It doesn't cost anything. Live your best life now. It doesn't cost anything to follow God. We're throwing them on, purposely throwing them on, on rocky ground. And scriptures say when the seeds that hit the rocky ground, they spring up quick. But what happens? They die because there's no root. They die when the troubles of the, of the world come because there's no root. Right? That's not the kind of faith we want to produce. That's not what making disciples is about. All right. And that's our call is to make disciples. So just a couple of additional questions to ask when we get in conversations with people is, uh, again, uh, what's keeping you, what's holding you back? And then listen to their hesitation or skepticism and, or argument against God. And here's another thing about this whole, whole discussion thing. When they're right, agree with them. That's important. We are living in a society that is afraid to agree with the person on the other side. That's not godly. That's not biblical. All right? Don't be that way. So when, so when someone that's struggling, that hasn't come to faith yet, speaks out truth and says, you know, this person in church or that person in church or whatever hurt me, I see this and that I think that's wrong. Very often it's going to be wrong. Agree with it. Agree with it. Right. Affirm that they, are, they understand some things that they understand that are true. Agree. All right. Um, and when you do that, you're gonna you're gonna um, cause their ears to open. Because wait, wait, this Christian is a, is agreeing with me that there's problems in the church. You know what's going on here? Aren't they supposed to be coming against me? Because what do they see on on social media? They see people coming against them. All right? Don't do that. They're not your enemy. You're not competing with them. You're not fighting against them. You are winning them. You are setting them free. They are the, the prisoner that, the, that God desires, desires to see set free. They're not your enemy. They're not your opponent. There is an enemy, but it's not the person you're witnessing to. We have to remember that. It's not the person we're witnessing to. It is never the person we're witnessing to. Our enemy is not of flesh and blood. All right? Um, so we have to remember that. So and agree with them when they speak the truth, no matter how hard it is. And even if it's about you, that puts some skin on it, right? Even if it's about you and how you failed them, agree with them. Agree with them. Be vulnerable. Be open. Speak to how God is working in you. Ask forgiveness. Agree with them, okay? Don't and then don't shy away from 
praying with them as God leads in a moment. We talked about that already. Um, so just in the uh, in the last seconds, I want to give us um, just some a real quick uh, illustration here about praying uh, about what our conversation should lead to. Um, you know, at TCC, our, we are so diverse with our stories of how we came to Christ that that I think we can be afraid to take that final step to to pray with someone to trust in Christ. We can be like, well, what if this isn't their story? <laughs> Even while we're trying to share the gospel, you know, um, I've had spiritual people, Christian people, tell me that they don't like the sinner's prayer. They don't like invitations given to respond to receive Christ at concerts or rallies or crusades. Because if someone is going to come to Christ and be sincere, then they should do it on their own. I think that's false. I think that's wrong. They can come to Christ on their own. But if you're in a conversation with the, with this person about the Lord and the Lord is leading you, if God is calling you to, to, to ask the question, and they're ready to receive Christ, don't back off on it and say, well, go home. You can do that on your own. Be used of God to write then lead them to the Lord. Sure. All right? What if Philip had said to the, to the eunuch, ah, you can do that later. Be used of God in the moment if God leads you in that way. God might never lead you in that way. You might just be a seed sower, never, a, never someone who sees that. Don't be discouraged with that. But if God gives you the opportunity to lead someone in prayer, don't shy away from it. All right? Um, that's an unbiblical idea to shy away from that if God's leading in the middle of it. In 2014, I took a, a group of youth to, to New York City. And we, uh, one of the places we stopped was at the uh, Bowery Mission in, in New York City. And I shared the gospel with the men at the Bowery Mission. And uh, came time to close the message. And and you got to understand, I, I, I come from a holiness background. I, I, I am ordained in the Wesleyan Church. And so... Uh, sharing a sinner's prayer, sharing the gospel, and sharing and ending with a sinner's prayer is, was very familiar to me. But it, I've been here since 2008, so I've been here at that time for six years. And so there's a lot of a lot about TCC that I really love. Um, but one of the things that I had kind of taken to heart, where I sh that I shouldn't have taken to heart, was this fact that we all come from different experiences. And so I interjected that erroneously, or injected that erroneously into my salvation message, and I. I didn't give them an opportunity to receive Christ right at that moment. I gave the salvation message and did nothing with it. And boy, did our leader of <laughs> the group, who was one of my professors from college, named Mike McNeil, he took me aside afterwards and says, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I just prayed a general prayer, you know, just, and if they're sincere, they can come to Christ on their own. He says, you don't know that this might be the last opportunity that they have to receive Christ. They don't know what, what, a lot of them don't know what's going on. They're not prepared. They're not directly connected with God like you are. Why didn't you take that opportunity that God brought you? They were ready. Why didn't you pray? Why didn't you lead them in the sinner's prayer? That still bothers me today. I know God is sovereign. He'll use it. He'll use that message in their life. But if God leads you to that point in a conversation, step out in bravery and ask them, are you ready to pray right now? Can we pray right now for you to come to Christ? Today is the day of salvation. Last thing, I want to give you an illustration about this. Right? As we're talking with people about the, about the Lord and as we share as we get to that point, right, as the, as the conversation gets to that point, can you imagine wanting to introduce someone to your spouse? You know, just the, you know, you just know that the two of them would hit it off and to be the, be the best of friends. And you're speaking with this person on the porch of your house and while your spouse is just inside. And you're telling them how great and how wonderful your spouse is. And finally, they express the desire to meet them. And you say, well, that's great. I hope, you have, I hope you do something. <laughs> if you are sincere, maybe someday you will. Have a nice day. 
And even worse, you, when you go back inside and see your spouse and tell them of the wonderful conversation you had about them, about with someone who could be their new best friend. And then they ask you, well, well where are they? It's not a perfect illustration, but I think it makes the point. You know, we, a lot of criticism I, I hear about messages and churches is that, like, oh, I don't, I can't listen to that church. I can't listen to that guy preach because after every single sermon, there's a gospel presentation. I want you to think about that criticism real hard. Because not everybody in that building knows the Lord, guaranteed. So I want you to think about that criticism the next time you hear it. All right, let's pray. Why are you asking the guy? Father, I just pray for, for each and every one of us as we consider our own relationships, as we consider opportunities that come our way, as we consider the people that you have placed around us, that you have placed us in the midst of, that you desire us to be ambassadors for Christ in their lives. Father God, I pray that you would lead us in every relationship to show who Jesus is and to show how much you love them and desire a relationship with them and that they can have new, abundant, eternal life. If they would receive. And so, Father, even now, just to make it real to us, Father, I ask that you place a name in our mind and in our hearts. Someone that needs to know you. You are calling us to reach. Place a name and lead us by your Holy Spirit. Share with you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.